Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Aaron Jones. Aaron is Director of Congressional Relations for the Wilson Center and host and producer of the popular podcast, Need to Know. Aaron joins us today to discuss, to discuss the newly configured 117th Congress of the United States. Aaron, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me back, John. Always a pleasure. So, you know, we were talking before we began recording and I was telling you, it's it's we're not going to just launch into a technical discussion of a new Congress and its makeup without discussing recent events. It, it, we can't ignore those. And I just wonder, as I was watching, my visceral reaction to what I was seeing, being familiar with some of those passageways and hallways and stairwells, and not nearly on the level as you are, as someone who's worked there and still works with the people who are there, both members and staff, what was that like for you to watch what was happening to this institution? And I, would it be fair to call you an institutionalist, someone who reveres the Congress? I think it would be fair to to call me that. And I actually, uh, when one of the first quotes that came to mind while everything was going on was from 1833, uh, Benjamin Choate, or Rufus Choate, uh, said that we have no national temple, save the Capitol. We mm -hmm. have no common oracle, save the Constitution. And that's really something of special about the American people. We don't have a national religion. We don't have a monarchy. Uh, the, really, our national institutions, such as Congress, as divided as it is and was designed to be, uh, really, that's, you know, really the beacon of our Constitution and our liberty uh, and, and we uh, just when I look at it, I, I have, of course, a lot of friends who are on the Hill uh, was reaching out to them while everything was going on just to make sure everybody was safe. It was amazing to me. We had kind of the uh, it, was, it was Columbine type moments of people hiding under desks and in internal offices uh, while glass was breaking and uh, shots were being fired and, you know, people uh, really rioting within the Capitol. It's just something that none of us, I mean, we had, um, you know, a pandemic that nobody expected and now an invasion of the Capitol like nobody expected. Uh, 100 years since the last pandemic like this and 200 years since the last invasion of the Capitol. It's been a, quite an interesting year so far. You have to wonder, you know, you think of the people who were hiding under desks and traumatized in ways that they probably haven't fully processed. Members had to rush back and certify the electoral college vote. Then we move quickly to impeachment proceedings. At some point, they're going to have to sit back and sort of process the trauma of what they experienced that day. Yeah, and I, I think this is something that everybody experienced it a little differently. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, who were fortunate enough to be working from home. There's a lot of congressional staff who whose offices have have them working from home. But this was a special day because the electoral count was being certified. So I think there were probably more staff on the Hill than usually are on, on the Hill. And of course, there were also family members of members of Congress who were there. Jamie Raskin, uh, who's also really just recently gone through some trauma within his own family himself, it, it, it brought his family and they were watching from the gallery when all of this began. So uh, it's not just the members, but you also have to remember the staff and the visitors uh, who who might have been there at that time. It's really uh, beyond uh, just at a human level. There's certainly regardless of what you think of our politics at a human level, it's really something that uh, tragic and, and hopefully everybody's able to process it well and ultimately that we're able to reconcile with one another just because somebody doesn't agree with you uh of course the wilson center is a nonpartisan institution you know we just want to give you good advice you know good nonpartisan right. advice no matter what party you're in you make the choice yeah but i'm glad you i'm sorry go ahead i was just going to say that that uh, ultimately uh, this might be a way for forward for us to reconcile a moment where the hand was on the stove and we pull back and we say wait a minute this this has gone too far uh, let's figure out where, it, it, like I said, democracy is going to be a situation where you're going to have differences, but that doesn't mean that because somebody disagrees with you means that they dislike their country. It's just that they have a different view of how it should run. And I'm glad you mentioned the human dimension and, and use the story of the Raskin family as an example, because it's so easy when tweeting or engaging in partisan politics from a distance to forget we're talking about real life human beings, whether you agree with them 
or disagree with him. So let's leave the the melodrama and tragedy and, and the shock behind and talk about some of the nuts and bolts of a, a changing Congress. What's it like for the members who are going, particularly say in the Senate, where you're going from a ranking member to a minority member or chairperson to just another member of the committee? So, you know, it's, it's different for the House and the Senate. Uh, the Senate it runs a little bit looser than the House. The House has 435 members. And so if you let things run loose in the House, you're going to have chaos. This is why there's no filibuster in the House, right? If you let, you know, they would go on forever because you have 435 members who could talk forever. Uh, so the rules are a lot stricter. And it's funny that when, when it is transition time, it is like moving day freshman year of college. Like they're coming in, they're moving offices, uh, furniture is out, paint's done, carpeting's done, everything's new. Uh, in the Senate, things move a little bit slower. And uh, I, I've seen I've seen senators who, uh, you know, needed to move offices, but they need to wait for the other senator to move out of their office. And so they're in a trailer in the Russell Courtyard uh, in, the, in a temporary office for, you know, months sometimes while they, while they wait for this. This year, it's even more chaotic. Well, not so much chaotic, but it could also run some slow, more slowly because you have a, a transition of power that took place after the inauguration of the new Congress. So January 3rd, by constitutional rules, is when the, the Congress begins, but the Georgia runoff was, Jan, was January 5th. Uh, so, and those two senators need to be certified by their state. Those certification results need to be transported to Congress and the Senate would then need to sign them, swear them in. Once that happens, you have a 50, 50 split in the Senate. Uh, on, on January 20th, when a new administration comes in, vice president Harris would be the supposedly the tie breaking vote which some people would say would give the Democrats the majority, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's automatically what will happen because the Senate can make up its own rules and the Senate can do whatever it wants. And if you look back to 2001, Tom Daschle and Trent Lott, they had a power sharing, power sharing agreement where they, they had equal representation on committees. Uh, the minority was able to bring up the uh, bills onto the floor, a spot reserved only for the majority leader. Did they uh, share chairmanships of the committees as well? I can't, I don't remember off the top of my head if yeah, they did I, or I not. Could not. They had, uh, yeah. but uh, all of this, it was short lived uh, because it, it was changed with uh, when Jim Jeffords left the uh, Republican party and then switch parties gave, gave the Democrats a clear majority of 51. Um, so it's possible that President Biden could say to Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell, look, it'd be good if we had some sort of power sharing agreement. We're going to have, you know, stimulus, infrastructure, uh, things that are bipartisan coming up in the first year. Uh, maybe this can can work. Uh, I think I think it really is something that Biden could do as an institutionalist himself, somebody who came out of the Senate. The Senate's where a lot of bipartisan stuff happens anyway. So it's a possibility that there could be something different in the Senate than just a simple 50, 50 split with Harris as the tie breaking vote. But we'll have to Very see if uh, Schumer and McConnell are willing to do that. We'll have to see if Biden kind of gives them a little push in that direction. And we'll see, you know, a few yeah. weeks is a lifetime in politics. So, so given the razor thin margin, the plus one of the vice president in the Senate, and then the tightening margin in the house, where does this get us? Some have argued that this is a formula for more bipartisanship because you need more cooperation when you don't just have the bully tactic of overwhelming the other side with your, your vast numbers. What do you expect? It's possible that, particularly in the House, that you'll have uh, Nancy Pelosi as Speaker may face a similar situation that John Boehner faced as Speaker uh, when he had a pretty small majority uh, and a, a pretty frothy uh, minority within the majority of, of the Tea Party or Freedom Caucus who would oppose a lot of things that the majority would bring up. And it's possible that the Democrats within the House may have the same challenge with some of their more progressive members, uh, especially with a 50-50 split in the Senate. Uh, the Senate's basically going to stay how it has been. You need a you need 60 votes in order to overcome 
uh, filibuster. So you really don't have a governing majority. Now you won't have a, ma a governing majority after January 20th. There's going to have to be some compromises. And the House just can't send progressive legislation over to the Senate and expect it to pass. So there's going to have to be Republican votes on some more moderate bills, uh, which may make it so that the progressives are not as happy with the Democratic majority in the House. When that happened under Boehner's speakership, uh, for a while, the, the leadership in the Republican Party would go to the right wing of the Republicans and say, what do you want? Uh, they'd work out a bill that would acquiesce to what they thought that the Tea Party or the, the Freedom Caucus wanted, uh, and then it would lose on the floor. And then Boehner would go and craft a bill that would get Democratic votes. Uh, this ultimately led to so much discomfort within the Republican Party that they moved to vacate the chair and try to, uh, to push Boehner out, which he eventually decided that he, it, he'd had enough. Uh, and now when you talk to him, he's a very happy man uh, when, <laughs> when you see Boehner. Uh, but ultimately, the, the, the Democrats may find themselves in that similar position because they have lost seats in the House. I think that's a, a fact that has kind of been lost within the last few weeks of turmoil. Uh, the Democrats lost seats. They still hold the majority, but they have one of the slimmest majorities in decades in the House. From the perspective of policy and of leadership, which of the changes are you watching that you believe are most noteworthy, most worth paying attention to? You know, I, I, I see a, a congressman like Representative Meyer, a, a freshman from Michigan, who most people didn't know who he was outside of his district, but because of his response to both the riots and the impeachment, he's now instantly a national figure. So those are kind of X factors that, that are hard to anticipate. But when you look at the makeup of committees and the switching of chairmanships and the changing margins, what impact do you think that's gonna have on policy? You know, you know, are there issues that now will move to the forefront that have been in the background? Are there committees where their work will change significantly from what we saw under the past regime? There are really three things that I'm watching. One is one I've already mentioned is whether or not there's some kind of power sharing agreement that's set up in the Senate and whether or not a President Biden will push a majority leader Schumer and minority leader McConnell towards that end. Uh, the other thing that I'm watching is uh, I sort of mentioned it already before is sort of the the recognition within both of the parties of the challenges they face as parties. Uh, obviously, I think there's been a lot of talk about this, about the Republican Party. What does the Republican Party look like? What does it embrace and espouse post-Trump? Uh, that's, of course, remains to be seen. We really don't know what this even looks like six months from now. And, uh, you know, uh, so it's hard to know, uh, but it's certainly something I'm watching. And then something else that's kind of fallen down below the radar is what goes on in the Democratic Party. Uh, like I said, they've lost seats. Uh, how did they lose seats in a situation where you had their presidential candidate win more can more votes uh, than any other presidential candidate in history? Uh, and yet the, the sitting president won the second most votes than any other pres presidential candidate in history. So why was it that the Democrats were not able to sell in this environment uh, all of their congressional agenda. So, and then the third thing I'm watching uh, is appropriations. Uh, of course, you know, I worked for the appropriations committee chairman when I was on the Hill. So I am I'm kind of an appropriations nerd, but uh, there's been an awful lot of spending. And I wonder if spending fatigue is going to set in after this next round of stimulus. Uh, we spent about $7 trillion in FY20. Uh, we just passed a, 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 new, a smaller stimulus package than what it looks like President Biden will want to do in his first 100 days. So uh, that would count towards FY21. And that's before you even get to the uh, the appropriations process which you know allocates about a trillion dollars every year if there's an infrastructure package that's passed in the spring uh that's going to have a price tag with it too suppose that's a trillion dollars so the the trillions just keep adding up uh and to a point where people don't even recognize what a trillion dollars is right now but our normal budget and just to kind of put it into perspective a, a normal year our normal federal budget is four trillion dollars if you take four trillion dollars one dollar bills stack them up they're going to go past the moon okay so just that that's just a normal budget year 
take seven trillion dollars is going to go it's going to go even you know just think, to mars literally spending <laughs> the moon so the, the, the at some point republicans and democrats are going to just start to sweat a little bit i think about the deficit situation and the spending situation once they get past uh, a stimulus bill all this while we're still trying to manage an epic and historic pandemic crazy stuff so so uh, of, of all the very interesting points that you said you'll be tracking i want to ask you about one you mentioned when you worked on the hill you worked for a republican member uh, you have friends on both sides of the aisle you work for a nonpartisan institution one of the narratives out there is that uh, post-Trump, the Republican Party may be in the midst of some sort of uh, internal civil war for will it be the Trumpists who control the party or will it be other voices like a Mitt Romney? Is this narrative authentic to you based on what you know and who you know? Or, or is this some sort of media construct? How do you see it? Uh, I think that there is, uh, there's certainly soul searching that goes on within the Republican Party, but there really has been for a little while now this is this has been a long time coming uh the question among a lot of people is are we going to be a party of ideas are we going to be a party that just yells at the other side uh and so that i think is is really the question that a lot of people that i know on the hill are asking uh but keep in mind there have there have been uh books written about the destruction and death of the republican party for decades now uh, and recall after the 2008 election, uh, with super majorities of Democrats elected in both houses of Congress, President Obama coming into office with this huge swell of popularity as our nation's first African American president, Arlen Specter quit the Republican Party so that he could have a chairmanship because he never thought that there would be a Republican majority again. There were books written uh, saying the lost majority and how this is never, you'll never see a Republican Party again. Well, what happened in 2010, right? Things it lasted can change. two years, right? It lasted two Things years. Things can change quickly in politics. And so it's hard for us to see now. And I think, and I'm, I'm real big about perspective in the context of history. It's really hard for us to see right now you know, which way any party goes from here, right? Post Trump, really, right. because I mean, think about it. The Democrats for the last two years have, have had four years have had Trump to talk about, right? What do they do? Right? So it, 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 what does the media do when they don't have Trump? So there's a lot of things post Trump that we can talk about. We don't know what it looks like six months from now. It could be a completely different party. There's an opportunity for, I think there are some uh, more libertarian strands within the Republican Party that are kind of showing in some cases. Uh, you know, it's not all, you know, QAnon and conspiracy theory people. The, the, the Republican conference consists of over 200 members, not all of whom are, are like that. So I think that it's there's a lot of soul searching that's going on and it's hard to say what it'll look like six months, a year or four years from now. Uh, but I warn people about what we've talked about before. Well, we think think the Republican Party is going to die. Uh, we, we've heard that talk before. Oh, all predictions of new permanent majorities have faded fast. It's never held. Uh, and I appreciate you bringing in the historical perspective, Aaron. It's part of one of the reasons I really enjoy talking to you about these things, because the passions of the moment might indicate one thing, but the trend lines might say something altogether different. Before we close, let me ask you, you mentioned you called yourself, I think, a, an appropriations nerd. So I want to ask you the sort of the wonkish question. Uh, rule changes come and go all the time on the Hill, more than people even realize, because many of them are of a minor sort. Any anticipation of changes there now with the Democrats driving in the Senate? Rule changes? There have been some changes within the Democratic Party of how they uh, put their members into uh, committee slots. Uh, and so one of the biggest rule changes is an opportunity for younger members to get a chance to, to step up into chairmanship roles or ranking member roles. And uh, so that a person who, a member who runs, a senator who runs a committee, uh, say, you know, if Pat Leahy runs the Senate Appropriations Committee as chairman, he can't also be the uh, Health and Human Services chairman of that subcommittee or the defense chairman. Uh, subcommittee. So this gives other people uh, like Senator Tammy Baldwin or Chris Murphy the opportunity to step up and take some of these chairmanships and they're just not they don't have the double dipping in, in chairmanships on big committees and subcommittees. Uh, that's going to give a lot of, of, well, some new faces to 
rising up into cardinal status on the appropriations committees. Uh, some younger members, which, you know, is always something that they're always churning for these opportunities to take part in leadership. Uh, we'll, we kind of may start to see some new leadership start to bud within the Senate. Aaron, thank you. As always, always learn something new. Good to speak to a student of Congress. So then I become a student of yours. Thanks for being with us today. It's an interesting institution. Always love to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, and I should also tell our, our viewers, uh, I mentioned Aaron is the host and producer of a terrific podcast called Need to Know. If you're not subscribing, what are you waiting for? Uh, you can find Need to Know by coming to wilsoncenter.org. Thanks again, Aaron. And thanks to our viewers for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon on Till Then for all of us at the Center. I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.